Good day. Um, I'm Dr. Anthony Lang from the University of Toronto, and today I've been asked to discuss the various approaches to the management or treatment of multiple system atrophy. I have a number of disclosures. Uh, none of them are uh, terribly relevant to this uh, current talk. So as the audience probably knows, we subdivide multiple system atrophy under the clinical presentations of those with predominant Parkinsonism or MSAP. The term striatonigral degeneration was often used for this. Those with ataxia or the cerebellar form, multiple system atrophy C or olivopontocerebellar cerebellar atrophy. And patients with a combination of the two, particularly with autonomic disturbances and this had the old term shy Dreger syndrome. And I think the clinical presentation obviously tells the audience where the concentration needs to be for management issues. So we recognize that a very high proportion of patients uh, have autonomic failure, and this is almost needed to make a diagnosis. A large proportion, especially Caucasians, have Parkinsonism, a smaller proportion, possibly more frequently in Asian populations, have the ataxia or cerebellar features. And there are also features of pyramidal uh, tract dysfunction, with, uh, sometimes with spasticity. So the Parkinsonian subtype predominates in most populations. Um, there is some evidence that these patients may survive a shorter period of time. And there's even a, another form called minimal change MSA, where the substantia nigra, the dopaminergic region, and Parkinsonism uh, is almost exclusively present. So when we talk about Parkinsonism, we're referring to slowness or bradykinesia, the stiffness or rigidity, postural instability, sometimes tremor, um, ataxia being present in limb, gait, speech, eye movements, and then autonomic failure uh, involving blood pressure fall when patients stand up with faints sometimes, urinary incontinence and retention, constipation, and erectile dysfunction. In addition to those predominant features, we also have problems with respiration, uh, problems with the posture of the trunk muscles, bulbar dysfunction, meaning difficulties with speech and swallowing, and then a variety of other features, such as rapid eye movement, behavior disorder, emotional incontinence, mood and behavior, et cetera. So you can see from those last two slides, quite a large number of problems that we need to think about treating. Uh, the management of MSA is really then very complicated and best handled by a team approach, not only like myself, a movement disorders neurologist, but if possible, someone who's a specialist in autonomic dysfunction, a urologist, a sleep medicine specialist, physical medicine, allied health professionals, palliative care specialists, and others. So a team approach really, if uh, it's possible, is the best way of managing these complicated patients. In an ideal world, we would be talking about disease modifying or protective therapy, managing the symptoms, and even restoring brain function. And this is the way we uh, present and approach the management of Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative disorders. And so this is, makes sense to approach this in multiple system atrophy as well. So let's start with disease modifying or protection. This is a very large, complicated table that I don't expect you to take in entirely that tells us of the number of completed trials that have uh, reached phase two or three. So in human patients in larger numbers of people, um, often a randomized placebo controlled trial in a variety of different drug treatments. So you can see a list of different treatments, the proposed mechanisms of action. So neurotrophic or growth promoting, anti-excitotoxic, anti-inflammatory, um, anti-inflammatory here, stem cells, et cetera. Unfortunately, the vast majority of these uh, trials have been negative. You can see on the right side of the slide, I bolded those where there was some suggestion of an effect on disease modification. The effects have been mild, interesting, and need a further confirmation. But unfortunately, on the whole, these treatments have been unsuccessful. <laughs> 
Experimental treatments are being uh, considered, being studied in animal models and in early phase trials. Um, as the audience probably knows, multiple system atrophy is what we call a, an alpha synucleinopathy because it relates to the deposition and aggregation of this protein, alpha synuclein. And so there are a number of therapies that are de um, defined to um, address the presence of the abnormal and aggregated alpha synuclein. We know that um, a variety of um, uh, inflammatory markers and evidence of inflammation in the brain is present, so anti-inflammatory therapies are being pursued. Other neuroprotective strategies are being applied, and then uh, cell-based therapies, mainly with these mesenchymal stem cells, have been used. And this is another uh, slide that I've created from a, a very recent review paper that um, demonstrates the uh, small number of phase one and two. These are usually trials in uh, healthy volunteers or very early trials in a small number of multiple system atrophy patients. So you can see alpha synuclein therapies and a variety of others that we hope may reach some evidence of safety and tolerability that might go on to uh, larger scale phase two trials in patients with MSA. The whole reason for trying to um, define disease modifying therapies to prevent patients from reaching the more severe phases of the disease. And to do this, as I uh, emphasized in a lecture last year, um, we need biomarkers that allow us to make the diagnosis much earlier. And until we have those, we're going to be applying treatment at a rather late stage. So the hope is that these disease modifying therapies will in the future be applied to earlier stage disease. So let's move on to other treatments. And this is a slide that I've revised, a slide that I often use when I talk about treatment of Parkinson's disease. So here's the protection or disease modifying. And then there are a number of symptomatic therapies, medical, surgical, and even restoring cells that have been lost. The problem is that most of these therapies are uh, approaching dopamine dysfunction or loss of dopamine in Parkinson's. And unfortunately, we know that the pathology of MSA is more than just dopamine. That's why we call it multiple system atrophy, many brain regions. And so these treatments that can be very effective in Parkinson's may be inadequate or inappropriate in multiple system atrophy. But that doesn't mean that we can't apply them with some benefit. So let's talk about the management of Parkinsonism. In the earliest statement on how to diagnose multiple system atrophy, this is the consensus statement that was published in 1999, it was emphasized that the main criteria for possible MSA was a poor response to levodopa if the patient had Parkinsonism. This is the second consensus almost a decade later, and once again, to make a diagnosis of probable multiple system atrophy, you had to have very little in the way of levodopa response. However, we recognized after that, through a number of studies, and these are two main studies, that a fairly high proportion of patients with Parkinsonism, MSAP, in these two studies, one from Europe and one from um, the United States, uh, approximately 50%, or maybe just a little bit less, of patients with Parkinsonism had a levodopa response that could be sustained for more than uh, two years. So this really had to be reconsidered in making a diagnosis. And these are the very latest criteria that have just been published this year, where we're emphasizing that in clinically probable MSA, you can have Parkinsonism, but you don't have to insist on a poor response. So clinically established MSA has at least one of these criteria with poor levodopa response, but you don't have to have that to make a convincing diagnosis of MSA. So that's why we always try levodopa up to a thousand milligrams, sometimes even more, when we have a patient with Parkinsonism and often get a useful beneficial response. In patients who fail to respond to levodopa, some people use dopamine agonists, 
I must admit, in fact, I tend not to use these. There has been a little bit of literature suggesting people who fail levodopa may respond, but I think the evidence is very limited. We do, on the other hand, usually give patients a, the benefit of a trial of amantadine up to 300 milligrams per day, and some people who fail levodopa response benefit from amantadine. Other options include anticholinergics such as trihexafenadyl and benztropine. Rarely will these be useful when levodopa is not effective, but sometimes with treatment resistant tremor and or rigidity, you may find some benefit, especially in young patients who uh, you aren't worried about cognitive disturbances as we often do in Parkinson's. When patients do develop good response to levodopa, a proportion of them will develop disabling motor fluctuations and dyskinesia, and we tend to treat these patients in the same way as we do in Parkinson's, even to the point of using continuous infusions such as uh, a duodenal um, levodopa, carbidopa, intestinal gel. Rarely, on the other hand, will we consider functional surgery such as deep brain stimulation. Most patients fail this, and some patients actually uh, get worse after surgery. So you have to, if you're, if you know the diagnosis is MSA and you're thinking about functional surgery, I really think the patient should be involved in a research study of uh, that. Other issues you have to consider are the possibility of worsening orthostatic hypotension when you use dopaminergic drugs. Some patients fail to show benefit from Parkinsonism, but will develop dyskinesia just the same. So you see so-called dyskinesia without overt benefit. And some patients will get very severe cranial dystonia. And that's sometimes a warning, in fact, that the patient with Parkinsonism actually doesn't have Parkinson's disease, but has multiple system atrophy. And then if you're going to withdraw levodopa from somebody who you think is not benefiting, you should do that fairly slowly because some people who you think weren't improved uh, will show bulbar worsening and may have a, a pronounced worsening of their swallowing if you withdraw drugs too quickly. What about dystonia in multiple system atrophy? As I've mentioned, always think of the causative effect of the dopaminergic drugs, especially if you're dealing with cranial dystonia. Botulinum toxin injections in the neck, hand, face, and eyelids for so-called apraxia of eyelid opening or true blepharospasm uh, may be useful. Unfortunately, patients with MSA have often pronounced anterocolis or severe flexion of their neck, and this is usually quite resistant. You can try botulinum toxin into the digastric muscles. If you can show that easily accessible anterior neck muscles such as the sternocleidomastoid are, or, um, are active, if the EMG shows pronounced activity, you might use those, but you have to be very cautious about swallowing. Uh, more likely, it's the deep cervical flexors that are involved in this antrocolis, and you can't routinely inject them without very severe uh, dysphagia. Other oral agents might be considered for dystonia, such as anticholinergics, baclofen, benzodiazepines. Very rarely might you think of functional uh, surgery. Other movement disorders in multiple system atrophy. Unfortunately, ataxia, which is quite disabling in a fairly large proportion of patients, uh, fails to respond to all pharmacotherapy. Some patients, when they're still ambulatory, may benefit from uh, physiotherapy, working on balance and uh, uh, postural mechanisms. When you have severe rest tremor, I mentioned uh, the possibility of anticholinergics and other anti-Parkinson medication. When postural and action tremor is pronounced, uh, you can treat these patients sometimes with drugs that you would use in essential tremor, such as propranolol, primidone, gabapentin, and topiramate. Often these are ineffective, and with propranolol, off, you have to worry about worsening orthostatic hypotension. Some patients have prominent myoclonus, and uh, here is where uh, clonazepam, uh, valproic acid, levetiracetam may be useful. And then if you have a patient where spasticity is pronounced, uh, baclofen, benzodiazepines, and maybe even botulinum toxin injections, for example, into um, the thigh uh, adductors might be useful if they have pronounced spasticity. But I must admit that's fairly uncommon in MSA.
Now let's move on to the management of autonomic symptoms, which can be very problematic. Neurogenic orthostatic hypotension is a very significant problem in these patients. The definition is a postural fall of the blood pressure of 20 millimeters systolic or 10 millimeters diastolic within three mi minutes of standing. It can be delayed beyond that up to greater than five minutes. And importantly for it to be neurogenic, you need the lack of compensatory tachycardia. So this is defined as a change in heart rate uh, over systolic blood pressure of less than 0.5 beats per minute per millimeter of uh, um, mercury uh, systolic blood pressure. So that defines it as neurogenic. And the symptoms are broad with orthostatic uh, dizziness and lightheadedness or loss of consciousness, blurred vision, fatigue. Always remember the possibility of falls as the consequence of orthostatic hypotension. And some people get the so-called coat hanger sign or shoulder or neck pain um, as a manifestation of orthostatic hypotension. There are a number of non-pharmacologic treatments of orthostatic hypotension. This is a nice review by Kuhn et al. Uh, last year. So cold water boluses, especially if you know when the patient is going to feel um, lightheaded, say after a meal, or if they're going to get up to do something, have them drink 16 ounces of water quickly, wait for several minutes, and that has a, um, an osmopressor response. Uh, countermeasures uh, may be useful, uh, contracting the lower limbs, for example, crossing uh, the legs, buttocks, etc., elevating the head of the bed, avoiding large meals, especially carbohydrate rich, um, avoiding excessive physical uh, exercise, maintaining uh, and increasing lower body and core, core muscles, however, definitely avoiding alcohol and avoiding hot temperatures, and also eliminate or change offending medications. If the patient's been known to be hypertensive, always think of the role of anti-hypertensive uh, anti medications. Um, increasing salt intake, compression stockings, often not very well tolerated by patients, especially if they're very slow and uh, Parkinsonian. And after meals, think of uh, an abdominal binder. This is a slide that I'll let you look at. I won't go through all the details, but there are several drugs that may be useful in the management of orthostatic hypotension. And I've given you the um, maximum dose, not the starting dose, but the maximum dose in each of uh, fludrocortisone, a mineralocorticoid, mitodrine, the alpha-1 adrenal receptor agonist, um, droxydopa, not available in all jurisdictions, but available in the United States, uh, is converted to norepinephrine, an artificial amino acid, paritostigmine, a peripheral inhibitor of acetylcholinesterase, uh, atomoxetine, is a um, noradrenergic reuptake inhibitor that is, and I'll show you in a minute, only effective in people with central causes for neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, as is the case for MSA. So this is not useful in people with peripheral neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, as in um, peripheral neuropathies or in Parkinson's disease. Yohimbine is not widely available, but you may be able to get it compounded by specialty pharmacies, an alpha-2 adrenergic antagonist. Um, Ocreotide is something that may be useful as uh, treatment for postprandial hypotension. Remember, I mentioned the abdominal binder. And um, acarabos is also a treatment that may be useful for uh, postprandial hypotension. So these two treatments would be selectively used for that purpose. And in anybody who's on dopaminergic treatment, for example, for their Parkinson's, always consider that this treatment could be contributing to their hypotension. And at least in Canada, we have domperidone and many physicians in the United States are able to get a hold of this peripheral D2 receptor blocker. And this is sometimes quite surprising in its effect, even when you didn't think that your dopaminergic treatment was contributing. This is a bit of a cartoon that shows you where each of these treatments are effective. And as I've mentioned, the peripheral nervous system um, may be most impacted by uh, these reuptake inhibitors, whereas the central nervous system um, uh, disease in multiple system atrophy allows these drugs 
to have an effect. This is a slide just uh, showing you a clinical trial of droxydopa reducing the number of falls in people with Parkinson's disease. And the same would apply to people with neurogenic hypotension, orthostatic hypotension with multiple system atrophy. So always think of the possibility that falls are possibly secondary or in part related to orthostatic hypotension. This is a slide just showing you some of the treatments that are in the pipeline. And uh, I mentioned atomoxetine, but amproloxetine was a treatment that looked very promising. But unfortunately, just last year, Theravance announced that they were not going to pursue this further because it didn't reach the primary endpoint. And so it's been dropped from further development. An interesting treatment that's just been reported in the New England Journal. So obviously not something widely available, but I think we are very interested and we need to keep an eye on this space is the possibility of a, an implant therapy. This is a study in a single patient where they used a spinal cord stimulator that was effective in preventing quite severe orthostatic fainting that this patient with multiple system atrophy had. This importantly also was um, combined with quite extensive uh, rehabilitation and physiotherapy to improve the patient's ability to stand and walk. So it may not have been exclusively related to the treatment. One of the problems with um, patients with multiple system atrophy or anybody with orthostatic hypotension, and especially when we are treating the orthostatic hypotension, is high blood pressure in the lying position, so-called supine hypertension. And we have to remember that this may be associated with brain damage, and in this case, white matter hyperintensity, ischemic damage to the brain, as well as end organ damage, in this case, kidney disturbances with glomerul glomerular filtration rate and possibly even heart damage as well. So you see with increasing supine hypertension, you see worsening of kidney function and worsening of white matter hyperintensity. And uh, the probability of event-related uh, survival or event-free survival like strokes and blood pressure problems with um, cardiac consequences are all an issue. So we need to know how to manage supine hypertension, recognizing that some of the treatments that we're using for orthostatic hypotension are more likely these long-acting drugs like fluoronef and atomoxetine should be reduced if you're dealing with supine hypertension. You need to keep other drugs away from the time that people will be lying down. Keep them away from the time that they're going to bed at night and tell patients not to lie down for a few hours after they take mitodrine and droxydopa, for example. And then there are other treatments like elevating the head of the bed and then using other treatments that can lower the blood pressure like sildenafed, sildenafil, nitroglycerin patch, and other uh, hypotensive agents, but you only use these. These are short acting drugs that can be used overnight and then stop uh, or at bedtime, for example, or stopped when the patient wakes up, as in the case of the clonidine or nitroglycerin pass. Let's move on to some of the other problems that we deal with, mul with multiple system atrophy, and I'm going to quickly go through these. Sleep disturbances. There are treatment for rapid eye movement behavior disorder such as melatonin and clonazepam. Respiratory stridor, which is often nocturnal, can be very problematic. And there's a concern that this may be associated with sudden death in some patients with multiple system atrophy. The commonest treatment for this is CPAP. In the same way as we treat patients with obstructive sleep apnea, continuous positive airway pressure may be very effective for this problem. Rarely do we have to go on to tracheostomy uh, at this point. Also, in some patients with levodopa responsive Parkinsonism who are having difficulty sleeping, think about the possibility that they're having trouble sleeping because of treatment responsive bradykinesia or akinesia. But obviously, if you start using levodopa at bedtime and the patient gets up to go to the bathroom, they may have problems with a drop in their blood pressure at those times, so be very careful. Drooling is a very important problem in MSA. And so there are ways of drying the mouth with anti-muscarinic anticholinergics, and there are many of them. A glycopyrrolate is one that seems to be very well tolerated and quite effective. 
you always obviously always have to worry about urinary retention and constipation worrying, uh, worsening with anticholinergics. And then botulinum toxin to the, um, the salivary glands uh, is very effective and we use this quite extensively in um, hypersalivation or sialuria. Bladder symptoms can be divided under an overactive bladder and urinary retention. Overactive bladder may be treated in a variety of ways, uh, anticholinergics, uh, M3 selective, uh, M3 muscarinic selective anticholinergics, beta-3 adrenergic agonists, the uh, mirabegron, the uh, synthetic vasopressin, desmopressin at bedtime to reduce urinary output, and then uh, intrabladder injection by a urologist, the botulinum toxin. Unfortunately, many patients with multiple system atrophy develop urinary retention, and here they may require intermittent self-catheterization or an indwelling catheter or suprapubic catheter. Obviously, this may increase the risk of um, urinary tract infections, however, but it may be necessary. Constipation is a very prob uh, significant problem in MSA. And uh, I'll just let's ask you just to scan this list of many uh, drugs that can be used or many treatments, increasing oral fluids and exercise, very important, but then bulk laxatives, stimulant laxatives, osmotic laxatives, channel activation, chloride channel activation, um, and a variety of other prokinetic uh, treatments. Uh, uh, linaclopride and um, uh, procalopride are relatively newer treatments that may be quite helpful, lactobacillus, and then occasionally even botulinum toxin in the anal sphincter um, may be helpful in patients with dyssynergia. Erectile dysfunction uh, can be a significant problem in otherwise active men with early multiple system atrophy. Uh, this is a slide just reminding us that we have to think of a variety of other problems, including psychological factors for uh, erectile dysfunction. But obviously in MSA, it's often the um, uh, neurological cause of this. And so the usual uh, PDE5 uh, inhibitors um, may be very helpful. And so giving trials of these drugs that are widely available, the one problem you have to be cautious about is increasing orthostatic hypotension. And so maybe shorter acting drugs uh, might be more useful um, or uh, a longer acting drug uh, might have a milder effect. Um, so that uh, could be considered in, in these patients. Erectile uh, dysfunction in women is very much less appreciated and understood. There's very little work in this field. Um, female sexual function indice scores are significantly lower in women with MSA than controls. And the domains that are dysfunctional are desire and arousal, which might be um, helped by uh, psychological treatment, but lubrication may be something that can be managed uh, with the uh, usual lubricants. So uh, remember that there may be ways of managing this. Unfortunately, genital hyposensitivity is far more common in these patients than controls. And to, to my knowledge, at this point, there's no active therapy that uh, might improve that. There are a variety of other problems, motor and non-motor, that you need to think about managing. And uh, this, just, this slide just lists them. Freezing may be treated by amantadine, maybe high-dose methylphenidate, although there's very little evidence that this is useful. Posture instability in falls, as in Parkinson's disease, cholinesterase inhibitors. I don't think anyone would currently consider uh, pedunculopontine pontine deep brain stimulation. So more treatment with physical therapy and preventing the, the um, falls by accepting the need for a wheelchair in many patients. And then remember managing orthostatic hypotension. Depression and anxiety can be very important in these patients. So remember managing these in the usual fashion, involving a psychologist and a psychiatrist as necessary. Pseudobulbar affect may be responsive to antidepressants, particularly the SSRIs. Please avoid tricyclics because of their worsening of orthostatic hypotension. And then the combination of dextromethorphan and quinidine has been shown to be effective in other forms of pseudobulbar affect, such as in multiple system, 
multiple sclerosis, and in MSA, it may be very helpful as well. And then many patients have a variety of different sources of pain, dystonia, neuropathic pain, or musculoskeletal pain, and uh, remember to try to treat that with um, treatment appropriate to the nature and cause. And then remember the many non-pharmacologic uh, treatments and um, allied health professionals that we can uh, utilize in the management of these challenging patients in managing the palliative needs, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, physical medicine, speech and language, and also other treatments like dance, music, exercise, mindfulness. And remember that these patients in, with increasing immobility require our care from a distance. And so nowadays, uh, thanks to COVID, we are becoming much more familiar with telemedicine. So I'll stop at that point. Thank you for your attention. Unfortunately, I probably won't be available for questions at the end of this presentation when it's shown, but if I can, I, I'd be glad to um, answer questions at another time. Thanks very much.